Well, it's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with Andy this morning. You all here? Coming through there okay? All right. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, uh, presiding over worship with Andy. His, you know, his observation earlier reminded me of an old proverb. Uh, God is good. God is fair. To some, God gave brains. To others, hair. <laughs> you can sort that out, see what the implications are. That was a favorite of my dad's, too. I inherited this from him, so, you know. You have two very smart people leading worship today. So that's, you know. Well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, so, uh, today, we are continuing our uh, fall worship series, uh, for the month of September at least, on inward change and outward focus. Now, we are going from inward change to outward focus. So if you're looking at the graphic here, we go from bottom to top, right? Inward change first, and then outward focus. We're also continuing our journey through the first letter of the Apostle Paul to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, and our theme for this week is rooted in Paul's fond memories of the time that he spent with that community. Uh, now, as uh, we will see when we get to the end today, our job is to create those same kinds of fond memories and meaningful experiences in the church. So, uh, to that purpose, our title for this morning is The Good Old Days. Ah, the good old days, right? Well, the good old days, of course, as, as we all know, this is a, a, a euphemism, a, a cliche in popular culture. It's used most often to reference uh, a time uh, perhaps better than the current era, right? It's uh, mostly a form of nostalgia, and it reflects uh, often a kind of homesickness or perhaps a, a yearning for long-gone moments and uh, memories. Uh, perhaps when we talk about these good old days, we could also say that we're looking at things through rose-colored glasses, right? We've heard that expression before, too. But the interesting thing is that uh, this is actually not something we really choose to do. It's not something we choose to do. In fact, this kind of nostalgia for the past, for the good old days, it's a natural cognitive instinct that every person has to view the past more favorably and the future more negatively. It is literally a survival instinct in our brains. Now, is anyone here familiar with the concept of uh, something called survivorship bias or survival bias? Anyone ever heard that before? A couple of people? Okay, if, you, if you've studied psychology, you've probably heard about it. It's, it's a logical error in the brain in which we concentrate on the entities that have passed a kind of selection process while overlooking those that did not. And so in science and in mathematics, survival bias can lead to incorrect conclusions because of incomplete data or incomplete information. Now in life, it can lead to nostalgia for the past and fear for the future. If we're not careful, this kind of bias can lead us to uh, oversimplify things. It can lead us to overly simplistic beliefs and value systems, often based on incomplete information. So I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, as an example, in history, Survival bias can lead us to interpret a particular story or an event only through the eyes of those who are still alive to tell us about it, right? That would be a simple example. We would be getting their version of the story or the event, but not everyone's version of it. So, the Apostle Paul, I think, is guilty of some survival bias and some rose-colored glasses in Thessalonians today. And in fact, I think he's guilty of these things a lot throughout his writings and ministry, but especially in Thessalonians. Now, uh, Paul, uh, I think a lot of us realize this, but Paul is one of the most misunderstood figures in all of Scripture. He really was a 
deeply passionate Christian mystic. He was a very, very deeply passionate mystic. And his entire theology was rooted in his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And we all have heard this story before. But what I want to do today is uh, spend the second half of our message in the reading from Thessalonians and spend the first half reflecting on uh, this experience that Paul had and how it informed his theology and his worldview. So his conversion experience, it's not the only experience that he is remembering fondly. And of course, he should remember that one. But for Paul, this encounter with the risen Christ informed every experience he had afterward. Now, this experience is described several times in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts, of course, is presumed to have been written by the author of Luke around uh, 85 CE, about 20 years after the height of Paul's ministry. But Paul's own account of his conversion experience appears in Galatians. And it is such a powerful experience for him that he never doubts it again. It stays with him for the rest of his life and ministry. This revelation sticks with him. So this risen Christ that he experienced is different from the historical Jesus. And I love the historical Jesus, but that's not who we're talking about here. We are talking about the risen Christ the Christ who remains with us now, here, in spirit. Now, Paul, uh, this is so powerful for him because of where he came from as well, right? He himself describes his life as an Orthodox Jew prior to this. He was a Pharisee with status in the Judean governmental board. It was called the Sanhedrin, right, as uh, some of us may remember. And the temple police actually delegate the Apostle Paul to go out and suppress this new Jesus movement, which at the time is not called Christianity. It's called the Way. It's a movement called the Way. Now, Paul is ordered at times to threaten the disciples and the apostles with, with persecution and death and then carry out that persecution. And he himself says, I tried to destroy it. I advanced beyond my contemporaries in my own nation. I was more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers than anybody else. So Paul himself recognizes how this experience changed him. And of course, Acts sums it up very beautifully as well. While traveling to Damascus, before he reached the city, there came a light from heaven all around Paul. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asks, who are you, my Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What a strange thing for Paul to have heard. And he, he may have been wondering about that. Why, why are you saying that I'm persecuting you, why not these other people that I'm persecuting? But Paul, because of this, grows into an experience of the body of Christ. That becomes a major, major theme of his ministry and his theology. It's the union of Christ, this risen Christ, and those whom Christ loves. And eventually, Paul realizes that this is everyone and everything. And that's, uh, that's why we also uh, sometimes call him the apostle to the nations, right, or to the Gentiles. His ministry is for everyone. Now, meeting this risen Christ for Paul, it changed everything. It changed the way he thought, and it changed the way he lived. He experienced the crucified historical Jesus as the risen Christ. And he experienced the fact that he himself, a sinner, was also chosen and beloved. And he learned to see everyone else in this same way. So, not just his brain, not just our brains, not just his way of thinking or his mind, 
but his way of being, his way of living, his way of seeing all of reality and seeing others in front of him is changed. And so he goes to carry this message to all of the nations, to the Gentiles and the Jews in all of the communities he preaches in. And Paul is now doing this as one who was once despised by these communities, but who is now a saint to so many of them. And so Paul develops this great skill, this great, great skill that he uses a lot in his writing, in his ministry. He will take two seemingly opposing things, a weakness and strength, flesh and spirit, law and grace, faith and works, Jew and Greek, male and female, so many examples of this. And he will, rather than comparing one to the other or saying that one is better than the other, he will put them together as equal parts in the body of Christ. And it is so, so powerful that he does this and he invites us to do it too. So, that's just some of the background, right? To, to root ourselves in that experience and that, uh, that life and ministry of Paul. Now to come back to this theme, the good old days, in everything that he did, Paul remembered his conversion experience fondly, and it allowed him to see every experience he had as the good old days, because every experience he had was illuminated by his understanding of Christ. And even his time in Thessalonica fit into this category. And that's surprising, because not everything went well in Thessalonica, right? Bob gave us a little bit of background about this letter last week. This is the first epistle to the Thessalonians. It's addressed to the church in Thessalonica, modern-day Greece. Uh, New Testament scholars uh, all believe that Paul, mostly believe that is. Paul wrote this from Corinth not long after he left there, and that likely makes it one of his first letters, uh, maybe written around A.D. 52 or somewhere around there. Uh, the original language for it was, uh, again, in the context, the original language was Koine Greek, uh, also called Hellenistic or Alexandrian or Septuagint Greek. It was the common form of Greek in that time and place, right? It was, uh, it was the lingua franca, if you will, much like English is in so many parts of the world today. And Thessalonica itself is a port city, it's on the coast, right? And it's at the center of the Roman government in the province of Macedonia, north, north part of Greece. That means you'll find a mixture of Jews and Gentiles in this place. And Paul visits this place early in his ministry. He goes there early, and he preaches to the local population. There's a bit of a debate as to who his first audiences and converts were, but by the end of his time there, it is, of course, a mixture of Jews and Gentiles significantly. But, and here's where it gets kind of fun. Well, maybe not fun. Here's where it gets interesting, right? There's also a riot in Thessalonica while he is there. There is a riot while he's preaching. He has entered the synagogue, and he has preached for three straight Sabbaths and interacted with the people there. And he has declared that this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. Those were his words. Some people like what he has to say and join him or follow him or receive his message. Some people become jealous, according to the translation. And they bring along, and this is what the NRSV says, thugs who were hanging out in the marketplace, right? And they form a mob, and they start a riot in the city. And they're shouting, according to the history, they're shouting, these people who have been disturbing the peace throughout the empire have also come here. So the crime is that they are disturbing the peace of the empire. So these people are upset that Paul is proclaiming a king who is not Caesar. And then, as if the, the riot wasn't enough, and then uh, some of the Jews in Thessalonica actually follow Paul to his next location in Berea. It's a smaller city, a little bit inland, uh, not far from uh, the coast. And they essentially try to sabotage his ministry there because they see him as a threat to the sovereignty of the empire. And Paul then has to run away to the southern coast of Greece to avoid this angry crowd. 
So, that brings us to today's letter. That brings us to 1 Thessalonians. So we are going to take a, a couple moments and read through chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians together. Uh, these chapters in these letters are fairly short, so we'll, go, we'll read the whole thing, actually. Paul is writing back to the same community that he just got chased out of. Now, we could imagine he's writing to the people who agreed with him. We could imagine he's writing to the people who disagreed with him. And the truth is probably a mixture. The truth is probably somewhere in between. We simply don't know for sure. But Paul writes, So, when we couldn't stand it any longer, we thought it was a good idea to stay on in Athens by ourselves. And we sent you Timothy, who is our brother and God's co-worker in the good news about Christ. We sent him to strengthen and encourage you in your faithfulness. We didn't want any of you to be shaken by these problems. You know very well that we were meant to go through this. In fact, when we were with you, we kept on predicting that we were going to face problems exactly like what happened. As you know, we were meant to go through this, he's saying. That's why I sent Timothy to find out about your faithfulness when I couldn't stand it anymore. I was worried that the tempter might have tempted you so that our work would have been a waste of time. Now Timothy has returned to us and from you and has given us good news about your faithfulness and love. He says that you always have good memories about us and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. Good memories, he says. Because of this, brothers and sisters, we were encouraged in all our distress and trouble through your faithfulness. For now we are alive if you are standing your ground in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you, given all the joy we have because of you before our God? Night and day we pray more than ever to see all of you in person and to complete whatever you still need for your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus guide us on our way back to you. May the Lord cause you to increase and enrich your love for each other and for everyone in the same way as we also love you. And he wraps up here. May the love cause your hearts to be strengthened, to be blameless in holiness before our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his people. Amen. So. Paul, uh, to me, and I kind of did this with my voice as I was reading, Paul kind of changes tones halfway through this chapter, I think. I think he goes a little bit from a tone of denial to uh, maybe a tone of acceptance or, or, or reverence, perhaps, as he offers that final prayer. But I, I, I'm looking at this and, and reading about what happened in the book of Acts, hearing about what happened in Thessalonica at the time that he was there, and I'm thinking, is Paul remembering this right? I mean, is he remembering this okay? Is he succumbing to the same kind of uh, survival bias, perhaps, that so many others have when reflecting on the past? Is he looking at his time there with rose-colored glasses the same way he looks back on his conversion experience, which he should? Well, maybe he is, and maybe he isn't. But the funny thing is, it's oftentimes the hardest parts of our lives that are the ones that teach us the most. Oftentimes the hardest parts of our lives are the times that end up being the most meaningful to us. They're the times that make us who we are. They forge our relationships in the fire of adversity. They strengthen us for the road ahead. And I think maybe this, more than anything, is why Paul is remembering his time there so fondly. So, so I'll invite you for a moment. Can you, can you think of a time in your life that felt really difficult in the moment, but which you now remember very fondly? Now, there are, uh, there are perhaps uh, some wounds and some losses and some griefs that never fully heal. We understand that too, right? That is absolutely true. But there are also times in our lives that shape us. 
Is there a time you remember that felt difficult, but you now remember fondly? I'll give you a light example. A light example. I often feel this way about being a student. And uh, you know by now, I have lots of stories about my, my times as a student, right? I remember uh, various levels of education, how stressed I was about finals, about getting all my assignments in, about getting good grades, graduating on time. And in fact, I, had a, I recently had a couple of late nights at the kitchen table as I was uh, completing my ordination paperwork for the Board of Ordain Ministry. It reminded me of some late nights I had at the university library during seminary too. And now, I'm remembering all of it very fondly. Now here's the other thing before we wrap up. Here's the other part of this. Wouldn't it be great if everyone felt that way about being in our church? Wouldn't it be great if we created powerful memories of belonging and love for other people? If they became nostalgic for their time in the church the same way Paul is feeling nostalgic here? If they wanted to come back here again because it was clear to them that this was a safe place full of good people, full of God's love and grace. So, I think the calling here is let's not be nostalgic together, but let's create some nostalgia together. And I'll end with it. just one more little anecdote. Perhaps some of you uh, have seen this before. There's a great scene at the end of uh, the TV show, The Office. Any Office fans here, folks who have watched The Office? All right. There were more next door, and that's okay. <laughs> I got a few of you, all right. So uh, in the series finale to that show, Ed Helms' character is reflecting on his time working with Dunder Mifflin, which is the paper company at the heart of the show. And he says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. You never know when you're in the good old days. But maybe the risen Christ means that we always are. And maybe that's the whole point. Amen and amen.